Welcome to Read Aloud, Chapter 1, Confessions of an Ex-Scientologist Pothead by me, Liz Gale. Here we go. Confession, noun, intimate revelations about a person's private life or occupation, especially as presented in a sensationalized form in a book, newspaper, or movie. Oxford Languages. Confession number one. I was a terrible Scientologist. I was born in, so cut me some slack. I came into this world as a third-generation Scientologist. By my first breath, I was considered a lifetime member of the organization, though my parents wouldn't pay the $2,000 to make it official until my fourth birthday. Along with teddy bears and toys, I received my International Association of Scientologists Lifetime Membership, proof I was a card-carrying member. Most importantly, I knew that L. Ron Hubbard was the founder of all things Scientology and therefore was my unquestionable leader. I understood that he had unlocked secrets about the universe that no other human in history had ever come close to discovering. He had solved the mysteries of the universe and had developed a technology to guide us down the same path. I was taught from an early age that I was one of the chosen few. I was a Scientologist. Scientologists had the true technology to repair mankind's spiritual damage. Shamans, psychologists, and do-gooders could barely scratch the surface of healing. Only Scientologists could make Earth safe and prosperous by eradicating sickness, insanity, and war. Before I could count my age on two hands, I was convinced that without L. Ron Hubbard's Scientology, planet Earth was doomed for all eternity. Before I could count my age on two hands, I was convinced that without L. Ron Hubbard's Scientology, planet Earth was doomed for all of eternity. A Scientology Community Scientology was growing rapidly in the 1980s when I was born. My parents were proud members. In 1981, my father moved his successful software company from Los Angeles to New Hampshire to establish a Scientology community in his home state. He employed close to 80 people, many of whom relocated to be a part of the company and the crusade. Within a year, the goal had been met. At one point, the group had over 20 families, a school, and several other businesses like accounting and landscaping. More families meant more children. To fit the need, my mother started Bear Hill School. There, if a child got hurt on the playground, a Scientology contact assist could be administered alongside an ice pack. If kids weren't getting along, Scientology communication training could be assigned. It was a labor of love, she told me once. A young mother, she'd been dedicated to providing my older brother a suitable education. Four years old at the time of my birth, my brother Philip was an exceptionally bright child and already showing signs of exceptional intelligence. His math literacy was off the charts. He could read and write at a grade school level. At four years old, he called our parents by their first names. My parents made no secret of their goal to create a Scientology community in the heart of New England. My father smiled broadly on the front page of the local newspaper with the headline, Chichester School Businesses Are Run by Scientologists. His thick red hair and beard will be forever burned into my consciousness, boldly declaring his faith to the world. Despite being born into such a dedicated community, I didn't get very far on Scientology's path to spiritual enlightenment, referred to as the bridge to total freedom. As much as I tried, my Scientology career was nothing like my parents. They excelled up the levels at an unprecedented rate, both reaching exclusive top spiritual training levels. My parents quickly outgrew their local organization in New Hampshire, leveling up to special types of spiritual counseling that could only be undertaken at select advanced organizations. Only top churches like the international cruise ship, the Free Winds, could deliver these high-level trainings. For weeks at a time throughout early childhood, I would speak to my mother over the crackling line of a satellite phone while she cruised the Bahamas, studying Scientology's confidential materials. Nannies kept our home afloat during these absences. Other portions of my life were spent in Clearwater, Florida, home of a major Scientology mecca and community referred to as FLAG. Later, as a preteen, I practically lived inside the renovated hotel facility, the Celebrity Center International in Hollywood, California. Growing up, I was one of the most well-treated part of the Scientology circle, paying public. We were parishioners who bought the courses, services, books, and tropical cruises. We attended fancy events in historic ballrooms, the iconic shrine auditorium, and secret briefings with church leaders. 
My brother and I attended the most elite Scientology boarding school in the world, the curriculum of which was based on L. Ron Hubbard's study tech methods. Hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent in an effort to make us the best Scientologists we could be. My family was on top. We were one of the many cash cows that kept the organization afloat. Utopia didn't last. Spoiler alert, the black tie events and special briefings were fundraisers. Scientology boarding school isn't all it's cracked up to be, and religious headquarters are not always safe places. By the time my childhood was over, my father and brother were both dead. As I write this today, my relationship with my mother has disintegrated before my eyes, and I have gone on national television on an Emmy award-winning docuseries telling the world that Scientology is a dangerous cult. Third generation. Scientology was founded in 1953, 70 years ago. There are fourth and fifth generation Scientologists being born into the world as you read this. My grandmother read Dianetics, a modern science of mental health, sometime in the 1950s. She fell in love with L. Ron Hubbard's unusual approach to the human mind. And by the time she had her last child, my mother, she was all in. My children would be fourth generation members if I hadn't cut the cord. My biggest fear was that they would have been indoctrinated against my wishes and behind my back, even if I tried to prevent it. This wasn't a risk I was willing to take, especially when intentions had been stated so clearly and so early on. My family did not mince words. Your child is going to be a Scientologist whether you like it or not, my boyfriend, now husband, and I were told in early pregnancy. Before a baby bump had even emerged, the religion of our child had been established beyond our control. How he kept his cool as I melted into the couch in embarrassment, I'll never know. I can only imagine how he felt learning the mother of his child was raised in Scientology and his firstborn son extended family was emphatic that he would be raised in it too. I'll be forever grateful he didn't scream cult at the top of his lungs and run for the hills. Don't call it a cult. Growing up, cult was the worst four-letter word in the world. I'd rather have gotten caught using the other C word or any other profanity, but not cult. Even as a teenager during my rebellious stage, I knew that calling Scientology cult was asking for trouble. It was one thing to ask questions or even criticize individual Scientologists, but the line stopped there. Typically, when I questioned church policy or expressed skepticism over management, I was told to write up my crimes. What websites had I looked at that I shouldn't have? What anti-Scientology articles or documentaries did I watch? Which bitter ex-Scientologist was I talking to? The funny thing is, I'd never heard the word cult before Scientology introduced it into my vocabulary. In 1993, I turned nine and Scientology won tax-exempt status from the IRS. The same year, the book What is Scientology was published. Glossy photos and simple text clearly broke down every aspect of Scientology through the lens of religion. If there had been any confusion over whether Scientology was a religion in the past, this book aimed to set the world straight once and for all. It was in this effort to legitimize Scientology as a religion that catechisms were born. Like in Catholicism, catechisms are a set of questions and answers designed to explain the ins and outs of a religion. Members memorize these questions and answers as part of their religious education, often using this information to disseminate to others. Scientology catechisms are no different. They explain Scientology's fundamental beliefs on the nature of man, the mind's relation to spirit, etc. Most of the questions are simple and necessary, but there between the logical questions was a curious one. Is Scientology a cult? This was the first time I'd seen the word. I had no idea what it meant, but I knew what I had to do. According to L. Ron Hubbard's study method, a student may never pass over a word or symbol they don't understand. It's considered unethical. I didn't want to be unethical, so I looked up cult in my student dictionary. It defined cult as cult, a relatively small group of people having religious beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange or sinister. My nine-year-old mind raised a red flag. My tiny palms began to sweat. By definition, that's exactly what we were, a cult. We were a small group of people with religious beliefs and practices that others thought were strange. How could anyone deny it? We were a fast-growing religion, perhaps, but still relatively small compared to Hinduism or Christianity. Our practices and beliefs were definitely considered strange by the outside world. Even with single digits in my age, I knew that. Not long before, the Tampa Bay Times had run a story about my family with a photo captioned, Happy Scientologists. Even though dozens of Scientologists had written in declaring their children were happy and drug-free, the article expressed criticism of the church. 
I could see the sadness on my mother's face the morning the paper was published, and I wished I could take it away. The outside world didn't understand us no matter what we did. Moments of cognitive dissonance like this were painful, even at a young age. Even then, I remember wondering, why are they attacking us? Don't they understand how good Scientology is for the world? When it became overwhelming, I tried to push upsetting contradictions out of my mind. At nine years old, I buckled down and memorized the catechism as I was told, but I was never able to shake that nagging feeling at the back of my mind. Was Scientology a cult? Of course, Scientology vehemently denies being anything other than a bona fide religion. If you ask them, Scientology, quote, is a religion in the full sense of the word, unquote. Interchangeable terms. Take note. In this memoir, I sometimes refer to Scientology as a cult, other times as a religion. In the same vein, I call it both an organization and a church. There are times it acts like all of these things. For all intents and purposes, in this book, the terms are interchangeable. Other terms I use are high control and high expectation group. Exactly as they sound, these are groups that require complete loyalty from their members and expect them to conform in nearly every way. I encourage you, dear reader, to do your own research and come to your own conclusions about whether Scientology is a cult, a religion, a high control group, or a business organization. Perhaps you'll find, as I have, it's a little bit of each. Generational indoctrination is incredibly powerful. People who join high control groups in adulthood have a major advantage over those who are raised in one. They're way more likely to have healing and health when they get into the real world once again. Those of us born into cults have no previous sense of identity to fall back on if we decide to leave. We have to build ourselves up again. We have to build ourselves up from scratch all over again. We have to redefine our core values, connection to a higher power, and reclaim what spirituality means to us. We have to rediscover the meaning of life, and our lives in particular. Whatever we were taught in the cult, we have to unteach ourselves when we leave. After Scientology, there is much to unteach. As a child, I believe that everything that L. Ron Hubbard wrote was factually true. He did not make mistakes. Anything he wrote about physical health, family, sex, drugs, sickness, insanity, study, business, or even household cleaning, I believed wholeheartedly. For the first half of my life, L. Ron Hubbard was the only source of credible information. I took his accounts of visiting heaven, where he wrote, quote, Yes, I have been to heaven, and so have you. It was complete with gates, angels, and plaster saints, and electronic implantation equipment, end quote, at his word. My grandmother, I believed that Dianetics and thus Scientology could heal man of illness, disease, and insanity. Questioning this authority wasn't something I realized I should do until much later in life, once the stakes were much higher. The thing about true believers. The most dedicated Scientologists I have ever known are members of my own family. They are individuals who know how Scientology works. They are sure that Scientology training and processing will bring them ultimate control over the universe. My father was a true believer until he died unexpectedly from a heart attack when I was 12. Another longtime Scientologist, my stepfather, who'd spent his early days working for the church and is still deeply involved to this day, filled his parental role. My stepfather entered the picture when I was 14 years old and, before excommunicating from me, was in my life longer than my real father was able to be. If you question a true believer about their faith, there isn't a moment of hesitation, an iota of doubt, or a crumb of uncertainty. They may act disgusted with you if you bring up a negative documentary or a lawsuit involving Scientology. Some may get defensive or even angry. Others will laugh and swear that the victims are bitter ex-members and the allegations are lies, even if they don't know what all the allegations are because they won't read the articles or watch the shows. In most high expectation groups, members are not allowed to view information that contradicts the leader or looks poorly on the group. Scientology fits the bill. They treat negative stories like infectious disease with dire consequences. Members who expose others to anti-Scientology information can be silenced with a written non interbulation order, which is a bit like a gag order. It can force a member's silence on a topic or order certain people to stay away from each other until the matter is officially handed on church channels. Ch children don't receive an exemption from this rule. A friend of mine at 12 years old was charged with spreading dissent at boarding school and was issued such an order. She had gotten caught talking negatively about a staff member who had abused her at a previous school, also a Scientology-endorsed organization. 
Instead of investigating the claims, reporting to the authorities, or punishing the perpetrator, she was isolated from her peers and made to do manual labor as amends. With no parent there to advocate for her, no mental health or child protective oversight, she was then made to gather peer signatures to allow her back in the group. Only once she'd gained enough signatures could she resume classroom studies and have enrichment opportunities like movie night or weekend playtime again. Mortifying. Some members are so indoctrinated that they'll police themselves against negative news. When Going Clear debuted on HBO in 2015, my own parents coincidentally canceled their decade-long HBO subscription. They didn't tell me why, but I knew there was a campaign for current Scientologists to boycott the channel to protest the unflattering documentary. I doubt this movement had enough numbers to make an impact against HBO, especially since the documentary went on to win three Emmy Awards, but bless their hearts, they gave it a good try. If my mother and stepfather weren't telling me the truth, I'd understand why. By the time this groundbreaking documentary aired, I was in my 20s and I truly was spreading dissent. Behind closed doors, I had begun to ask too many questions and I was getting more confident demanding answers. Did you hear about Scientology's prison camp, The Hole? A top Sea Org member under oath described it as being a prison camp for Scientology executives who had displeased the leader. Did you hear that current Scientology leaders' dad, stepmom, brother, sister-in-law, and niece have all left Scientology? Did you hear that his dad was followed by a private investigator with guns? Did you know that both his niece and his father are writing tell-all books? Why did they think Scientology was so expensive? If the goal was to spread the technology across the planet, shouldn't it have been more accessible to the average person? Why wouldn't they watch Going Clear or read any of the ex-Scientology accounts of abuse? As Scientologists, wasn't it their self-appointed job to confront the truth? What were they so afraid of? But there were some questions I didn't have to ask. I'd already come to my own conclusion. Some people were afraid of the truth. I was a true believer too. I was scared of the truth as well. For the better part of my life, I tried to be a good Scientologist, a true believer. In the early years, I was convinced L. Ron Hubbard's magical promises and mystical processing would fix my pain. I thought there was no other way for me to feel better. No other religion or practice could get results like Scientology could. It never did work out for me. There were times I felt great. Introspective talk therapy gave me a sense of belonging. I'll admit it was nice having someone listen to my thoughts as I worked through problems in my life. It was nice to have someone who cared, even if their interest was paid for by the hour. The thing about true believers is that they are convinced they are right, no matter what evidence is presented. True believers never waver in their faith. They know the real truth where others can't see it. They know something you don't. They've found the one true way. Their minds are made up, and there's no story of abuse, abandonment, or child neglect that will make it past this tightly closed thought loop. You cannot make a person change their faith. You cannot force a person to change their mind, or even listen to ideas that contradict or threaten their belief system. Sometimes it's best to plant a seed, a small idea, and leave it up to the universe. One small contradiction can lead to questioning, which can snowball quickly into a full-blown faith crisis. When people ask me how to support friends or family that are still in Scientology or any high control group, I have one answer. Be there for them when shit hits the fan. Be ready with a plane ticket or a prepaid cell phone and an open mind. They might not come to their senses right away, so be patient. It takes time to peel the layers of indoctrination back. It can be a long, painful process. I'm still waiting for anyone else in my family to leave Scientology, but I'm not holding my breath. I hope they know that I'm here for them no matter what has transpired in the past. It can be so hard to admit when we were duped, or worse, that we were part of the problem. Rest assured, the outside world is full of compassion and kindness for ex-cult members. There are help and resources waiting for you. I'm waiting for you. The wrong side of Scientology. There's a word for people like me. Suppressive person. Anyone who wants to destroy Scientology in any sense is considered a terrible, awful person, a person who doesn't want anyone to succeed or be happy. A suppressive person will attempt to ruin any form of social betterment. Their one true intention is to keep others down. Ex-members who speak out against the church are almost always given this title. This label ensures all current Scientologists will cut ties with them immediately. Many exes have lost their jobs, homes, and families due to this internal church policy. Some true believers can then justify all sorts of harassment, frivolous lawsuits, and rumor attacks against a suppressive person. 
Some people will do anything to protect their ideology. Human history is full of gruesome tales of religious persecution and martyrdom, moments when people would rather die for their beliefs than let them go. A quick internet search returns dozens of articles, videos, and first-hand accounts of people who say they've been harassed by Scientology members, private investigators, or lawyers on Scientology's behalf. All this effort to shut up critics and activists makes a person wonder what else they have to hide. Scientology doesn't do much to deny claims of harassment anymore. In a 2015 lawsuit, Scientology was accused of pointing hidden cameras toward an ex-member's home, constantly watching who came and went. Anyone believed to be working with that member was allegedly added to the church's list of enemies. Lawyers at the time argued that constant surveillance of a critical ex-member and his wife was their constitutionally protected, quote, right of free speech, quote, right of association, and, quote, right to petition free speech, free association, end quote. Luckily, a Texas Third Court of Appeals judge disagreed. I have not seen the actual paper that declares me a suppressive person, but I assume there's one out there. After all, good Scientologists don't go on national television and talk shit about their religion like I did. They don't have social media dedicated to cult awareness, education, and the dangers of Scientology culture. They don't write books like this one, that's for damn sure. If you're curious what kind of backlash I've received for putting this book into the world, please find me on social media and contribute to my legal fund online. If you're reading this, I'll probably need it. I hope you enjoyed that reading of chapter one of my book, Confessions of an Egg Scientologist Pothead by Liz Gale. That's me. And I hope that you'll pick up a copy on Amazon, maybe leave a review and let me know what you thought in the comments below. I'll be continuing to read chapter by chapter and I would love your feedback, comments, ideas, thoughts. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye.